Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. You're listening to Double Feature. My name is Eric, and I'm here with Michael Kester. I'm here to help you, Eric. So you wanted to look at Solitude today, which is interesting because uh, you brought up a couple movies that aren't necessarily about solitude. No, they're about the buddies that you take with on a trip to solitude. <laughs> yeah, these are, um, you know, you could call them takes on the buddy film. But uh, it's really not even until mentioning the idea of solitude and the buddy element that, uh, that I even thought about that. But we're going to definitely spoil the movies. Yep. Whether there's solitude or not even could be considered a spoiler. Yeah. So we're already doing it. In fact, I'm going to spoil them a little right now. I'm going to drop the title bomb. Yeah, please. Uh, we're going to spoil Moon and we're going to spoil the trip. You're such a professional with the name of the movies. Oh, thank you. And um, you can use the chapters. Haha. -ha. See, I can be on top of something here. <laughs> How's that for some one-upsmanship? You like that? Whoa, whoa. Yeah, you can use the goddamn chapters to skip over this witty banter that you've come to know and love week after week. Come, come now, Eric. <laughs> you enjoy one-upping as much as I do. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this show. You know, I wanted to say before we move into this, one of the things that I love best about our show is uh, you have referenced the crazy period in my life probably just as often as I have. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where I found podcasting was when I was I in fucking... I still haven't found podcasting. Complete isolation, and I had no voices in my life. Right. I was in a bad spot in my life. And uh, I was able to listen to people on podcasts, and there was something kind of therapeutic about having the same voices come back week after week. And people write into us, and it's honestly, for anything we ever do on this show, it's the simplest thing, but I also feel like the, the thing that makes me the most happy about it is that a lot of people work in solitude, or they work in just complete isolation from other human beings, or they live that way. They're in a remote area of the world, or they have a strange job, and they listen to our show week after week, and we keep them company. So we like to remind them of their loneliness and isolation by invoking it uh, in topics on the show as often as we can. Right. Uh, let's go to space. Let's go space. Let's go moon. Unless the internet is fucking with me, I'm pretty sure Duncan Jones, director of Moon, is the son of David Bowie. Yeah, I don't really know it's if the possible internet is fucking a, with you. David I, Bowie is the hardest thing to pin down, and it is fucking 2013. I know. Okay. Dude just came out with a new album. How many David Bowie fans do you know alone? Just you. Not one of them knew this album was coming out. Yeah, I know. Isn't that weird? Not one person. Yeah, everybody. I, I think 50% of David Bowie fans thought he was dead. I feel like I would know that David Bowie had a son that directs heady sci-fi films. And You'd I think don't. so. Duncan Jones also did Source Code. And possibly that's most right. mysteriously is that's about it. Yeah. So he just, he appeared like this Bowie album out of fucking nowhere <laughs> and is doing, you know, a Sam Rockwell sci-fi movie with fucking Clint Mansell score and... Yeah, and Kevin Spacey voice. I mean, so let's just, let's just take as a thought experiment, Eric, mm -hmm. somebody walks up to you, they go, okay, there's a sci-fi movie starring Sam Rockwell and the voice of Kevin Spacey with the score by Clint Mansell and David Bowie's son directs it. The internet is fucking with me. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be. I wanted to talk about the Clint Mansell score. I know we've mentioned him before, but we, uh, we didn't get too in-depth. And he's, really, he's one of my favorite composers right now. I'm just sure. really interested in what he's doing. I think he's, he's one of those composers that comes up and you, uh, he's, he's, not your, he's not your Howard Shore, mm -hmm. but he's one of those fucking reliable kind of, he's the subculture of scores. So there's a director usually associated with Clint Mansell. Yeah. And I think that's why this is an interesting uh, place to talk about him, because this is not a Darren Aronofsky movie. That's correct. Mansell did the score to basically every Aronofsky film. Sure. And we've talked about his scores in particular on those shows, but he had a music background 
uh, he was in the band Pop Will Eat Itself. Yeah. And he did these scores that, although it's not as numerous as really any other uh, extremely popular or mainstream composer, his music for as, as uh, I don't want to say as little of it as it is, because there's all the Aronofsky stuff, there's um, Stoker and Smoking Aces, and this is an example of one of his space scores. You know, he's recently started looking at that stuff a little bit more. He picked up the score work on Mass Effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's got a fair body of work, but you probably hear his work 10 times more than how much work he has because, you know, his score has been picked up in so many places. It's been, especially that Requiem for a Dream score a we Requiem talked about. Requiem for a Dream score, yeah. I mean, that has to be, you know, it's reused in ways only classical pieces of music sure. uh, have been reused. With the exception of maybe the 28 Days Later, uh, In the House in a Heartbeat. Yeah. You know, how frequently that was used from 2007 to 2009 in every right. goddamn movie and trailer ever. And trailer, yeah. I mean, the Aronofsky scores have been so reworked. There's been remix albums. There's been recut versions for trailers. There's been orchestra versions for trailers. Uh, his music's become fairly ubiquitous, not only in the drama genre, but even in genres outside. You know, you would not call Requiem for a Dream a sci-fi movie. No. But the number of times does that, have a walking fridge that uh, Requiem. Uh, <laughs> piece has been used in sci-fi trailers and in fantasy trailers and in drama trailers transcending all these different genres and then uh brings it i think even better with the score from the fountain which is probably oh still one God. of my favorites that's my favorite definitely and then the moon favorite. score has a really good i mean there's one or two pieces that you know i can actually kind of think of how they go in my head sure for music being as lyrically oriented for most people and mm -hmm. for myself as it is, uh, they almost have a catchy kind of uh, pop sensibility to them. Is that, yeah. as a musician, does that make you cringe when that's, I say that? No, that's They're memorable. What, they're catchy. They're, that's why you can fucking whistle the Simpsons theme, man. Is that's because, what I'm talking about. Is because Danny Elfman was in a band that had singles and radio versions and music sure, videos all sure. through the 80s. Pop will eat itself. I know they toured with Nine Inch Nails sure. back in back in the late eighties, early nineties. I mean, yeah. If you're in a band, part of your fucking job is making music people are gonna stick to. Yeah. And that's gonna stick to people. Which is why you turn off the TV and you can you can remember Ice Dance. You can remember yeah. the score from Requiem for a Dream. You yeah, can, they stick with you. They do. You can tell the difference between Trent Reznor's in the Hall of the Mountain King and the one from fucking Fantasia. I yeah, mean, right, these are you right. just know it's yeah. it's one of those things that comes from going from having to make the type of music people are going to remember to trying to make music that is. I mean, film scores. It that's not lyrics. That's not the lyrics of the film. It's the fucking heartbeat. It's what's going on right. behind the film, and it's probably more dangerous to come up with catchy tunes as a score yeah. than any other possible mistake you could make writing a score. Well, that's the thing we talk about so often with uh, some of our favorite directors is simultaneously satisfying that art house part and that mainstream sensibility part. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think Clint Mansell does really well with his score is it has a catchy uh, popular appeal part to it. But also, it's effective. Man, you saying heartbeat? I mean, that is it. Yeah. You know, Moon has such a... It enhances the feel of the, the whole film. Moon would be a completely different feel if you altered that score even a, even a tiny bit. Sure. And it's just... It's one of those kind of unsung components, too, where a lot of times if the score is effective... I mean, we talk about that all the time. Uh, less score is more effective mm -hmm. score. You know, if you don't notice the score at all, it might be the most effective. And that's dangerous to do with a film like Moon, because while the film is gorgeous and it's just so well put together, it's a tiny, tiny film as yeah. as far as the sum of its parts. I mean, I want to keep have... saying space epic because those are sure. words you say together, but it's not an epic. It's, it's a, a tiny, tiny, personal... tiny movie. Yeah, it's a tiny little movie. That's why I love the name. I love Moon. That's the name. Yeah. It's a tiny little movie. 
It's it's got one fucking actor, one know, right? fucking robot, and you're not even yeah. on a planet. Eric. Yeah, I know. This movie know, right? doesn't even give you the respect of a planet. Yeah, you're on the moon doing a boring job. <laughs> yeah, I mean this this film, the sum of its parts is so small, and yeah. that's no easy feat to create a weighty film like this. Well, and we've seen before the kind of uh, silent running '70s space. I mean, the space in the '70s did a lot of that emptiness, sure, and you know, isolation and themes of uh, the kind of themes that we're dealing with here, but. I feel like Moon challenges so many conventions, specifically of science fiction. Oh, yeah. Where it'll make a choice that shows you it's obviously aware of what's come before, almost as if it's paying homage to it, but does something completely different. I mean, look how bright space is. Yeah. On the moon. <laughs> Think of the infamous starless moon photos. Oh, yeah. But in moon, space is fucking bright. Mm -hmm. I mean, he pulls down the brim of his hat. That whole beginning where the sun is just off screen and it is blinding. He wears sunglasses in space. How often do you see sunglasses in space? Nothing right. clever or there's no joke there. It's just, uh, it's utilitarian. You need sunglasses in space. Of course you do. It's fucking bright. The yeah. sun is right there. Blinding little clone Sam Rockwell on that little planet while they harvest helium-3. So we know about helium-3, but we don't spend a lot of time learning the situation. No, it's the whatever device. Yeah, and there's problems from the start, too. I mean, we get that things aren't quite right vibe. I mean, he's seeing things, and we have these kind of weird video anomalies. And then there's the crash, so there's disaster and conflict right away. Right. There's no space epic getting set up, getting comfortable, learning sure. about all the weird, you right. know, living in space is strange and different than you're used to. Right. And then also the movie's giving you these fades that are just surreal and upsetting yeah. and... It doesn't release the tension you're building up. It, you just get no closure. It makes your skin crawl. It's perfect because the film starts and goes, okay, you've seen space. Let's go. Yeah, right. The film right. the film doesn't do you the disservice of, of going, you know how like sometimes people are in space for like years and then they go crazy. I'm one of those guys. No, it's it's that guy's been in space for three years. You know why he's crazy? He's been in space for three years. So yeah. that's why he's a nut job. So this is what I love about our, our show being uh, spoiler inclusive is we get to talk about things like this. This is an odd moment to have a spoiler. But 20 minutes into the film, we get what I feels like, uh, you know, the twist of the movie, which is that there is several Sam Rockwells. A far lesser movie would drop the clone bomb way later. Totally. That totally. would be that would be the that would be the purpose of the movie is you. I mean, and it's not that it's not that it would even go about it much differently because we get the accident and then what is ostensibly the same character waking up and his introduction mm. to his rehabilitation and then a lesser film would go about that guy having no problem and right at the end finding the crash site sure. and the body and moon. Think about the order of these things too. The order just, it plays this up even more. You, uh, you have no time to get used to what life on the shuttle's like and all that. And you get right into there's several of this character and uh, oh my God, what's going on? But just at that moment, when they show you there's a couple of them, you have all of these questions. Right. There's all these these plot points that you need resolved and you want Do they answers. Know? Yeah, right. And the movie does the most frustrating fucking thing ever, which is when you desperately want them to stop being normal and address what the hell is going on, that's when they go, well, we'll show them working out and hanging out and building models sure. and doing normal stuff. Well, it's it's great because the two characters, they get to the same fucking house one through the front door, one through the back door. I think we've talked mm -hmm. about this before. They go to the same place, but the original character is, I'm a little crazy, so maybe he's not there. Yeah. And the new clone just wakes up, goes, oh, I must be a clone. I guess we're clones. All right. <laughs> I mean, right. he's fresh. He's fresh off the boat. He's not, he's unfazed. He's well-rested, relaxed. Well, you, you got to remember, too, the the onboarding story. Sure. That, uh, oh, you've been in a crash and you're a little fucked up. So he might also just think he's seeing things. Yeah, but you basically get this character who's, oh, I guess we're clones. Right. 
and the other the other character is uh am i even real sure and so their basic reaction is i don't know i'm gonna ignore that guy for a while sure yeah well, and as you learn about this clone thing, it's kind of an excuse to tell this story about, you know, the same sort of space themes, the same what does three years in space do to a person by showing the clone at an end of its cycle versus a clone at the beginning of its cycle. Right. It doesn't become about, oh, there's clones and what is the mystery and intrigue here? Sure. And where's the original? Right. Exactly. It's not about discovering the sci-fi mechanic. It's about using that mechanic to tell a story about what it's like, to tell the classic sci-fi story, to tell the guy sure. in space for three years goes nuts story. And seeing those two, uh, the way Sam Rockwell plays these characters just so differently, how serious one guy is and straightforward and angry yeah. and how the other is feeble and defeated and how they both react to like what you said. It, I mean, it's honestly the same kind of situation they're faced with. Just sure. being in different points. You get to really see side by side, here's what three years of damage looks like on this person. Here's right. what that clone probably looked like and how he reacted to things in the beginning. Here's how that guy reacts to literally second by second the same situation at the very end. And that's actually not even my, uh, my favorite of the convention defiers. I think anytime you do a space movie, there's this strange nod you have to do to 2001. Sure. Um, Kubrick's uh, Space Odyssey. Right. I say that like anyone's not going to know what I'm <laughs> right. talking about. It's yeah. such a goliath of a film. The portrayal of technology in film is really interesting to me. It's one of the things that's very much at the, you know, it's close to my heart. And there, anytime you do a piece of AI in a movie, it's hell from 2001. Yeah. Sure. It's always hell. And so you play this game where, I mean, it's just the most famous artificial intelligence rebels against humans sure. in a movie ever. Well, and uh, if you want to look at it that way. How else would you look at it? I don't know. You could look at it like two dudes get in the way of uh, a character trying to find higher intelligence. I'll take the bait to your illusion, though. I think AI over time is becoming more and more a real part of our lives. Sure. It's, you know, it's in our phones and we talk to robots now. And so it's something we want to put in our movies and it's something our society, I think, becomes more and more interested in over time. But filmmakers have this weight of being compared to hell. They have to. All the time, there's going to be comparisons to hell. So you're faced with these choices. Do you run away from hell, pretend it doesn't exist? I'm doing something that just happens to look like hell. Right. Play on previous knowledge of hell, but give your own twist. And in defying the conventions, Gertie does this really, I mean, it does a pretty amazing thing. You start at the beginning, it's Kevin Spacey. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Spacey, first of all, Kevin Spacey as a ship's computer is the best fucking idea ever. I yeah, would die. Absolutely. Yeah. I and the sad face I mean, monitor, just the I build mean, of the whole just machine. Talk about people you want to do your GPS voice. Well, that's what I was thinking of, right? I remember telling you once about the Snoop Dogg. Yeah, uh, Snoop Dogg is voice. number one. Snoop Dogg is number one. Although, if they could, uh, you know what? We'll get into that another time. I'm going to go with Kevin <laughs> Spacey, number two. So, a lot comes from that same weight you're given with Hal, where it's come before and everybody knows it. You have an advantage. You're using that to your advantage with Kevin Spacey. I think a lot of this is people know Kevin Spacey. Sometimes when you do a character in a movie, you don't want a name. You want it to be completely fresh. The audience doesn't see the actor at all. And it's someone like Kevin Spacey, I mean, frankly, a lot of people see him and they, they have fun sure. hanging out with Kevin Spacey. They don't think about him, you know, as the character. He's not transparent as the character. And... Here, you want him to be the name because you want to set up this kind of warm familiarity. Sure. You know, people like celebrity GPS because it sounds like Snoop Dogg is telling you where to go in sure. your car. Yeah. I mean, that's why Paul Giamatti reads Philip K. Dick instead of some dude. Exactly. It that's why that like, matters. Yeah. You're, it's not just the performance, but also that if you release yourself to the fiction enough— you feel like you're just you're hanging out with Kevin Spacey as the ro you imagine the robot and you picture Kevin Spacey. So you have all that background that he has to bring to this character. It's just something that comes with him. But then also this isn't Hal. 
that kind of ominous nature of hell is built into it because you think about hell because you have to fucking think about hell. Right. And you, you know, you find yourself expecting the robot to betray him mm -hmm. from the beginning. It's sure. ominous. Or, the robot's going to betray him. We're so jaded at this point by the AI follows the program. Well, that uh, too. I'm just thinking the whole time, well, it's not, it's not Gertie's going to stick it to him. It's that, you know, whoever programmed Gertie, programmed Gertie exactly. to not do certain things. Exactly. So we're looking again at what do you do about the hell problem? Do you run away from it or give it a twist? Sure. Do you go, well, it's like hell, it's ominous, so it's going to get him? Or do you go, well, it's a nice robot, but it's programmed in such a way that it's going to get sure. him? Sure. And we do this interesting thing where we take a different approach to how the software is built. We look at sci-fi movie robots and see, you know, it's always incredibly sleek sci-fi hardware and that ancient screw the human computer logic. Right. And here instead we go, the software is going to be incredible and the hardware is going to be ancient. Right. And I think that's the thing, you know, in being the exact opposite of how it's usually portrayed. And honestly, from an engineering standpoint, I think more natural. The software gets ridiculously advanced and the hardware is whatever this cheap mining corporation sticks right. on the ship. That's what allows Gertie to help him. And it allows the audience to be surprised. You, you look at the fundamental programming of the computer and all the time, you know, you take something like Hal and Hal's programmed to, you know, make sure the mission works. Right. Gertie's program, you know, I'm here to help, which in programming language is, you know, make sure he's physically fit and make sure he sure. eats. And sure. if he's, you know, trying to uncover a conspiracy, you know, give him your password. And Sure. Well, <laughs> I guess it is still, I mean, it doesn't completely betray the idea of using software logic right it does still use software logic but it's a lot more basic exactly it says the software you know artificial intelligence is well written enough to handle itself so we're going to give it a simple direction we're going to say use all of the artificial intelligence programming the uh the giant base of ai code that we probably use in hundreds thousands of machines back on earth in the fiction of this movie and use it under the direction you're going to help this guy. And so you get scenes where, you know, he manually types in a password for him. Sure. I mean, that's not something you think you'd see from a sci-fi robot ever right. reaching an, reaching an art. You would think it just controls the entire ship and it just automatically puts in the code and it tells him things he can and can't right. do. I just think it's a pretty incredible look at a, a piece of sci-fi machinery that oh, yeah. manages to stay true to making sense in some kind of reality but also not being the same fucking thing we've seen over and over. Right. I'm already hating myself for how much I want to talk about impressions uh, with the trip, but that's okay. I got through all the moon without telling you how hard it was for me to focus, knowing that Sam Rockwell is indistinguishable in my brain from Dana Carvey, and I seem to be <laughs> the only person on planet Earth having this fucking problem. Wow. Well, all you got to do is look at the year that your VHS was made. And if it's a VHS, it's not Sam Rockwell. You don't have this problem? No one else has Dana this Dana Carvey, pre-2000, Sam Rockwell, post-2000. Only exception, master of disguise. Despite the common language of the trip, we are speaking English here. I feel the same way about British movies as when we come on the show and talk about Asian movies. Yeah? I feel like, here's another culture. I don't quite understand it. It's foreign to me. Uh, I'm not as well-traveled, perhaps, as sure. uh, the characters in the movie. British culture and British films have this general air of being beyond what is typically expected. I feel like British movies come to the table like, yes, we've already been doing that. American audiences have this air of coming to movies. Yeah, right? No, it's, so, it's totally the case. But I feel like American movies, we come to the table like Michael Bay. Start at the ground, build big robots, make some of them racist, have them explode in space. <laughs> British wow. movies go, yes, we've been doing films for quite some time. Uh, here's another. Hope you enjoy it. It's our own uh, racist British stereotypes that feed yeah. into how we... Uh, perhaps perceive these films <laughs> you know they also dress men up as old ladies and have them fall down the stairs so that's not what this movie's about though this movie's not about the kind of this when you think british comedy the thing that always jumps to mind the thing that i think often jumps to mind is monty python the kind of outrageous zany wacky the kind of comedy 
that really gets embodied by the troop that was Monty. I don't know if you have you ever seen a fish called Wanda? No, I haven't. That's uh, it's written by John Cleese, and it's it's just hailed as the funniest movie of all time. And it's one of those movies where you watch it and you just go, "This movie is gotta be funny," but <laughs> right, God damn, if I can't laugh at it. Well, I think it's also pretty revealing to look at something as successful as Monty Python and see what original audiences picked up on and then see what all your American friends think is really funny. Yeah, exactly. The answer is slogans. Yeah. And the the reality of all of this is we are two American guys and we're not we're not British. We're not part of that culture. And honestly, I think British movies are probably an underwatched sect of the film world for me. Yeah. I feel like it's not a foreign movie. So, because it doesn't have subtitles, but it's also not an American movie, so I kind of tend to not watch a ton of them. But it's the same sort of thing that you know I was afraid of with the Asian movies, is that I would come on the show and say, the Asian movies, lump them all in a group, <laughs> be a big fucking racist, and not understand anything about cinema. Right, that's what we just did already, though, so we got that out of the way. Well, what's funny is we did all the study of Asian films... And now I can just say Asian films like they're all one homogenized, you know, same fucking thing. Sure. And I just don't feel bad right. because I feel like I learned something. But I still have the problem with British films where I know they're not all the exact same movie, but I have to look at them through the lens of, well, what do I know about British film? Sure. As if it is one. I look at this and I go, what did we learn about Happy Go Lucky? As if that's going to help yeah, me at right. all. Yeah. Hey, I saw In the Loop once. What did uh -huh. I What did I learn during that movie that I could Big bring to this? Big Guy Ritchie fan. Yeah. How does this compare with Snatch? Ricky Gervais thinks midgets are funny. Does that help me at <laughs> all in solving this? You know what I mean? When yeah. We're talking about completely different uh, everything. Well, Literally you, everything about this is different. You want to talk about a film that requires some back catalog of, of work? Sure. Take a movie that stars... Two very well-known British actors that American audiences have no idea about. Right. And then treat them the whole time like everybody knows who the fuck they are. Right. Well, also, <laughs> uh, before we run away from it terrified, Michael Winterbottom. Yeah. Who, I mean, 24-hour uh, yeah. party people, right? That's it's, right, uh, yeah. You know, a huge title. I know it. I couldn't tell you what's on the cover. Yeah. I don't know what it's about. Yeah. Uh, I think Steve Coogan's also in it. But then also there was a cock and bull story, which is kind of, you know, same characters doing same hyper realistic thing. Yeah. It's got an aristocrats type white cover, <laughs> pink type and an animal on it. Yeah. I mean, this movie boils down to Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Helena's father and mirror mask. Yeah. I've got it. I've got a piece of knowledge. Yeah. Let's latch onto this. What does Mirror Mask tell us about the trip? <laughs> and Steve Steve Coogan, I mean, he's a fucking hilarious guy, but he was um he was in Tropic Thunder. Great, yeah. Briefly. Give me I, the, give me one American movie I couldn't tell you he's anything about. Pretty sure he's in Tropic Thunder. And other than that, he did a bunch of British TV. He's in a he's in a show that's on Netflix called Saxondale, which is very sure. funny. But really these guys don't do the type of American movies that get the wide acclaim aside from i guess tropic thunder right right but they're also referencing these uh huge huge actors i mean they're right. talking about mainstream cinema in the way that you invoke benny hill and we kind of mm -hmm. go okay well now i have some familiarity here we're talking about uh michael kane you know the michael kane impression scene is infamous from this oh, movie. Oh, yeah, sure. You will be so far away from knowing what the trip is or that this is even a movie anywhere. Uh, but you can definitely, you know, have seen this Michael Caine scene and people have shown it to you and people have right. shown it to people have shown it to you. It's made the rounds on the internet. It's a great scene. It's a lot of great Michael Caine scenes. But they're, uh, they're referencing some Michael Caine movies that I think American audiences will know. Sure. If... Only because of the remakes of them, yeah. but uh, the Italian Job from right. the late '60s, sure, big staple of cinema history, and then also Get Carter from the '70s. Yeah. Well, and they also mention Harry Brown, sure, yeah, which we did on the show, and I think Get Carter came up in that. But uh, Stallone did the remake of Get Carter, actually with Michael Caine, about yeah. ten years ago, which is uh, really interesting. And then the Italian Job is just as fucking weird, yeah. 
it's the director of Friday, Ice Cube Friday, uh-huh. and uh, Mark Wahlberg, Seth yeah. Green, Charlie Theron's in it. And then uh, most you know, deaf, Ed, most deaf, right? Edward Norton. Uh, yeah. Isn't Jason Statham in that? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. We've just ventured so far into insane territory. I can't even believe that's a thing that exists, but the Italian job, popular American remake. Yeah. And then the riffing on the bond bits as well. I mean, yeah. something as, as infamous as uh James Bond. Right. I mean, a huge history of movies and culture and, you know, one liners Something so perfect for an impression as the Bond films. Sure. His watered-down martini that he orders. What's the shaken but not stirred? Yeah. As Martin Sheen would point out, is just a (laughs) watered-down martini. You recognize that stuff, and maybe that's part of it, or I don't know where it comes from. But what I'm getting at is I love the impressions, and Michael, I feel so guilty about that. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing to come to this movie and go, wow, the impression scenes are really great. But the thing you have to keep in mind, and the thing that's really fantastic about the use of impressions in this film, is this could be the type of fucking Jeff Dunham level of comedy Mm -hmm. where he walks on stage with a fucking jalapeno and gives it a really offensive Mexican accent. Right. Talks for 20 minutes and all you want to do is just kill yourself and him. Sure. But instead it presents you with two notable respected actors. I mean, the fact that they're actors is really the key to this trick. They're technically, yeah, they're doing impressions and it is for your enjoyment, but that's really not what they're doing. They are flexing their acting muscles. Sure. They're two people, they're peers, and they're reviewing each other's abilities and works and the type of things that an actor, an impression is an acting exercise almost. It's it's sure the ability to pick up on nuances of a character or a person. It's being able to manipulate your voice to fit certain age you know, age brackets or whatever such thing. Right. So they're not exploiting impressions the way that a lot of impressions feel the way we think of it, the core of what an impression is. Exactly. Yeah. They're, they're not sitting there going, look how great I am at doing Mike. Their mom isn't sitting next to them going do do Michael Caine, do Michael Caine. They'll love it. They'll love it. Well, that's funny because what you're saying is the the very thing you were talking about being an idea of British films, that they are layered and that there's something deeper going on. Right. We're taking the stupid, stupid, oh, it's impressions, and we're going, well, actually, it's one-upsmanship and it's insecurities. Sure. And it's how many octaves, you know, can you do. Exactly. Well, and and the the element of one-upsmanship, it starts with... Stuff like impressions. It starts with, look how calmly I play the Bond villain. Right. Um, The subtlety. Sure. But it eventually turns into this weird thing where if you look at the film for what's going on, and it's really easy to watch the film and just hope that the two guys do bits where they talk about waking at 930-ish and you just fucking piss your pants laughing. Yeah. But the flip side of this story is this guy who doesn't want to be on the trip and another guy who is making the best of it. Yeah. And you have, so Steve, Steve Coogan is, is basically forced to be on this trip and he's going around and he's made a soundtrack for each part of England. Sure. And he's learned about, he's learned about the formations and he's been learning about this, this character who went on a similar trip and this actor and he's, you know, well, he did cocaine. So perhaps I should indulge in some cocaine and, He's learning about all these different things and why the rocks are formed a certain way on this sure. mountain. And he's coming off like a fucking cock. <laughs> and you have Rob Brydon, who's kind of being dragged along, and he just wants to have fun. I mean, he he recites poetry that is apropos, but he recites it like Ian McKellen because they both live in a similarly named city. Sure. He, uh, <laughs> sure. He's happy to do any impression requested of him. He He's just goofing off he doesn't mind sleeping in a different room and but the scene the part that really makes it all stand out for me is the part where steve is talking about how because of the way the certain rocks react with water or they've eroded they look a certain and and they're at that magnificent waterfall remember yeah sure and rob tells him to shut up right 
Rob says, yeah, I don't want to know why it's the way it is. I want to look at it and love the way it looks. Right. And then Steve gets all pissed off, climbs a mountain, and then a guy is up at the top of the fucking mountain and goes, you want to know why the rocks are that right. way? Right. So Steve, eye opening. Yeah. Steve goes, well, I know I do. I know why. And the guy's like, yeah, but you know, some of these and Steve's like, yeah, okay. All right. Bye. Right. That's kind of the moment where you realize that despite the, I just, I think this movie is one of the funniest movies. Um, it does have a lot of really incredible, I mean, stuff where I feel like I have to pause because I'm yeah. missing it for how, yeah. and it not even, so the impression stuff is really big, but just the weird dream sequences. Sure. With Ben like Stiller. The ben, the ben Stiller <laughs> thing's funny, but I think the funniest one is uh, Coogan is a cunt, <laughs> says dad. Says dad. Yeah. yeah. I just can't, I just and, lose it. It's great. But it, you, it also plays into getting back to your theme of uh, double usage. It right. plays into having these universal human concerns, or getting sure. old, not accomplishing what you want in life, disappointing your parents. Right. And that lingering feeling he has that it may be too late. Any second, it may yeah. be too late for him. And it's all under the guise of a fucking food trip. Sure. They're going sure. across North England and they're getting all this food. And I don't know, I mean, this this might be me showing the American in me, but I just feel like they come out and they show you all this fucking food and, oh, look how cool that looks. And, oh, look at these lovely portions. And they're kind of eating it in the movie. And they go, wow, this is, this is really delicious. Moving on. <laughs> the, whole, right. the whole premise of the film is that these two hilarious actors – are going to go out and enjoy some of the best food in the country. Right. And what goes on throughout the film is real life undermines the premise yeah. the whole time. Sure. They never really enjoy the food that much because it's, you know, it's just food. And they're never really having that good of a time because they're real people. And if they're not working, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> sure. Rob is away from his family Steve's girlfriend is in America and they're separated and nothing is right. really working out. And these two guys who are supposed to be the levity bearers and the, the guys who bring the funny to a sad situation can't make funny out of their sad situation. Sure. We can sit there and laugh, but they're not having that. I mean, Steve is pissed off the whole time. Half of his impressions are just to make Rob shut up. Well, but he they're... still can't be the small man in the box. <laughs> I looked up that app immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finished the film, immediately looked for the app. I also think that just the nature of the trip is to rub their faces in these things. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, think about his girlfriend won't go on the trip with him. So the whole trip is a reminder of their problems. Right. Every conversation that he has to have with Rob he has to have with Rob because his girlfriend won't be there. Mm -hmm. He has to sleep in the bed with Rob that could have been in the bed with his girlfriend. You know, they have the, um, the stones, the river stones are stuck yeah. in a metaphor. <laughs> it's a metaphor. I mean, literally, he can't even climb rocks without thinking about his fucking <laughs> life. You know, he can't escape it. It's everywhere. Sure. And then the food is, there is a forest for the trees moment of, yeah, whatever, eat the food, moving on. Yeah. You know, too many things in life to face, too much conversation. But it, in another way, I, I mean, I like that. I love it. I like that the journey is about the journey, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's the simple go-to for that. Sure. It's not really about the food. The food's an excuse. Right. It reminds me, you know, we did Sideways on the show. Yes, we did. And I know I've joked with you when we were planning this about this being the British version of Sideways. Yeah which I swear is more a joke about my American ignorance and oversimplification <laughs> of British films and that I am playing Rob to your Steve. But I do, I feel like it's a really unfair comparison, but I think back a lot to Sideways has some similarities that I think a comparison of the two would further inform what this film does. Sure. And one of the things is the focus on the food. Yeah. Or the, you know, in Sideways, they try so hard to focus on the fucking wine. Yeah. When who gives a shit and they don't really care. Right. And, you know, and they start to lose in their, the wine is an excuse not to deal with their lives. Right. 
whereas the food does not get in their way in the trip. Right. They don't care. You know, the camera can only try and show us the food is being prepared for about 10 seconds before they eat the food without giving a fuck about it. Right. I think about, you know, trips I've taken and I just got my tickets for the amazing meeting this year and I'm planning on driving through the fucking desert to get there. Mm -hmm. And you think about planning this trip and it's not even so much where you're going or the thing you're going to do when you get there. Sure. Although it's that too. I think back to trips I've taken. I think back to last Tam and I think, yeah, all the science and neurology stuff that was totally lost on me because of how fucking stupid I am was great. But also the half naked bacon and donut party was, sure. <laughs> right. you know, it's what you remember from these trips. And the way this movie ends is so perfect. And, and it's, it's really what I think sets it apart from sideways and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where these guys go on this trip and Steve specifically, because Rob is kind of a bystander to Steve's crisis. Sure. Steve is going on this trip and he's fighting so hard against having a good time because his girlfriend's not there and Rob is there and Steve can't feel connected to this trip no matter how badly he wants to. And he gets home and he's really bummed. Yeah. <laughs> he just gets home and he goes, man, now I'm home. Yep. You know, what would be better than being home. Sure. Being on a trip. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting to see these characters come home and one has a, a loving wife. Right, and exactly. And was trying to have phone sex the whole time. Yeah. And he's the guy who's, you know, just trying to enjoy the trip for what exactly. it is. But he's also got the better thing to come home to. Sure. You got the guy who can enjoy the fucking trip for what it is and goes home and is basically now miserable that he's there. Yeah. Says more, again, I think about the state in his life than it does about the journey itself. Well, and that's the thing is I think that this film ends up making this point that films rarely make, which is if you don't pay attention to the journey, you won't have one and you're going to end up home and just as fucking miserable as before you left for the journey. Even more rare, I'd say, is that the characters don't reach that conclusion. Sure. It seems, you know, when I think back through movies of any time I've been handed that idea, it's because the character has a realization. Yeah. And here you get to the end. And because the character doesn't have that realization, you get socked in the gut with it. Right. You get, oh, fuck, it, he got back and it turns out it wasn't all better because he didn't make the realization I'm now supposed to make. And, you know, leading the audience to that, as we've discussed before, is so much, it's, you know, the audience discovers it for themselves. It reminds me sure. of the thing we were talking about on Indie Game yeah. with Meat Boy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what a weird comparison to make, but... You know, you lead that audience to discovery and it has more of an impact on them. Doublefeatureshow.com, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com is where you can get in touch with us and find, I don't know, sideways if you want to go on the web and get that. <laughs> um, I got nothing. Uh, I'm going to do something bad for uh, show number 250. Oh, yeah. Here's my plan. All right. I know we've been doing these David Lynch episodes. Yeah. And, uh, we get half, one a year. Half David Lynch episodes. <laughs> well, it's because David Lynch is so heavy, it deserves its own episode, and we pair it with something else that we somehow still manage to talk about for 20 minutes. Right. Uh, so I'm just going to acknowledge that instead of lying to myself this year. And I think we should do Eraserhead and Wild at Heart. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>